Welcome to Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning for Thursday, January 5th. I'm your host, Tom Moore. The Indiana game is in 240 days. The game against Michigan in 324 days. All right, everybody take a deep breath. It's time to talk about the Peach Bowl. We're doing it with our good buddy, Ross Fulton, one of the X's and O's gurus at BuckeyeHuddle.com. There's been a lot of talk about that game, and we want to sort of elevate the discourse a little bit, have a little bit more of an informed conversation about what really happened, what you saw, what you maybe missaw during the game, and maybe what it all means moving forward. So, Ross, I guess let's start with Ohio State's offensive game plan, because I've seen some people talk about the fact that they really surprised George with what they did. So was it like a really bespoke, different game plan this week for this game, or did they just out-execute Georgia? Did they just take advantage of some holes in Georgia's defense? How, how did they put up 41 points on a defense that hadn't given up anything close to 41 points this season? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't think they did surprise per se. I mean, nothing that they ran on Saturday, I haven't seen them run before. I just think that they had a good game plan that targeted the holes and what Georgia does. And, you know, we talked about a lot of that both in my article um, before, the, like, you know, talking about what Ohio State should do and, and both talked about it with you as well. I mean, they really attacked the backside um, boundary, you know, like with a bunch of deep crossers that took advantage of the fact that Georgia wanted to play a lot of bracket or doubles on Marvin Harrison. And so, I mean, they kept running a bunch of their like heavy play action, pull up, pull linemen and run, you know, a, either a deep comeback to, to Harrison on the boundary or a deep cross to Luke. I mean, Time and time again, um, you know, they took advantage of they they picked up some of what Alabama did against Georgia. Like they used they they a couple of times faked like counter one way and, and they did a quick toss to the boundary. Um, you know, they found ways to out leverage Georgia's defense. So, again, not anything new per se, but just picking the right package of plays within Ohio State's offense um, that was successful until, you know, they were down so many guys that it's it sort of a, were a shell of themselves. Yeah, they were down their top, what, four running backs at one point, their top two wide receivers, their top tight end. You know, at some point, next man up, even then, even with next man up, eventually you do start running out of men at some point. So, uh, yeah, there's, there was, uh, you know, it, did, it looked real good for three quarters until Marvin Harrison went out and then a little less so, but even, you know, even after Marvin Harrison ran out, I mean, people have been banging the drum for CJ Stroud to run the ball more for basically two full seasons. And, you know, th there's obviously a lot that goes into that type of decision. You, you've you got the injury risk and the potential reward you got to balance out and maybe it doesn't make sense against most people. But, you know, were the plays that he made with his legs, including that really big one to set up the potential game winning field goal at the end of the game. Was that an indication that they need to at least have the viable threat of a quarterback run be a part of their offense in 2023. They don't need to run the quarterback 18 times, but do you need to have that as sort of something that people are constantly being vigilant for, even if you're not running it? Is that something they need to plan? You know, when you're figuring out your quarterback, is that something that needs to figure into that decision? Okay. So let's, let's separate this out, right? So we have scrambling on called pass plays, and then we have designed runs or, or the read game. So on the former um, again, as I talked about in my article before the game, Georgia likes, particularly in passing downs, to play cover five or you know cover two with man under. So you're you're covering all the men underneath with man, and then have two deep safeties. So that the downside of that coverage is everyone's backs turned. You have two deep safeties, so you have a lot of room for scrambling. And so I even said before the game, like when Stroud sees that, he has to be you know if, be willing to, to tuck and run in those situations, and he did it. Um, they also had a great design against that with the Xavier Johnson route up the seam from the backfield um, against that coverage and, you know, scored a touchdown on it. So, again, going back to the previous question, like, they had really good plans and, you know, I, I, I feel like a dead horse, but once you had to move Xavier Johnson to wide receiver and play Joy Roy at tight end and pass protection. So, anyways, okay, so there's that. I mean, I always think a quarterback, you know, if there's scrambling opportunities there, obviously that is important and effective. They also did use some, they obviously had the one designed run for Shroud that got called back for the, I think, questionable Mitch Rossi illegal procedure penalty. That was a nice design. You know, it's too bad they couldn't have gone back to that on the 
fourth and one, or, you know, if they, they hadn't wasted it there, they could have used it on the fourth and one after the fake punt, punt that, that, that wasn't. Um, they also used a couple of arc reads with Stroud. You know, after watching Michigan, and they have a much more mobile quarterback, and I, you know, I was screaming, I was saying, not screaming, but as I was posting on Twitter during the game for them, you know, you have to involve McCarthy at some point as a runner because that's like one of your most effective things. And if you're overplaying, so having the quarterback as a run threat in the read game always helps because you have to account for it. That said, you know, should Ohio State have gone going back? Like, should they have been running CJ Stroud against Toledo? Like, we saw what happened with the injuries. Like, if Stroud got hurt this year, that's basically the season. I mean, by the end, it was Stroud making plays in duct tape, essentially, outside of Abuka. So, you know, I think you have to be pick your spots. Um, I do think it's effective to have those plays and to show the threat of it so that a defense respects it. But I would be pretty, pretty uh, conservative in terms of using them until you really need to. All right. And then before we switch off of the offense, I did want to get your thoughts on the idea that Ryan Day might be willing and ready to give up play calling. And, you know, we haven't really heard exactly what that constitutes. Is that just game day play calling? Is that taking a step back from the whole game planning process? You know, we haven't heard any real specifics, but there was the Kirk Herbstreit report. And, you know, I mean, to me, the game day thing has felt like something that was probably overdue to happen. It's just, he's a very good game caller. He's a very good head coach. But asking someone to do both of those things at the same time has always felt like it's just a lot to put on one person at the same time. So, you know, what did you think about the idea that he may he may now be thinking about giving that po- at least part of that responsibility up? Yeah, it's a tough one. And I guess only he can fully speak to what, you know, I think it's more of like a weak game planning preparation. Um, you know, uh, Doug Lee Maurice actually had a good article in the the cleveland.com this week discussing you know he basically sat with the coaching staff through a week of game planning in november in the offensive staff and like it does underscore like to be the play caller on saturday you have to be the one in charge of everything on offense in terms of like conducting the meetings going through like what's going to go into the game plan for the week you know because it's like all right we need our out of our 150 plays what are the four we want on third and three you know second and goal um and so you, I don't think you could call plays on Saturday without taking the lead role in that. So I think that's really where it's more a question of like, is his best, you know, could his time be spent elsewhere? Like now that said, if he gives up play calling, I don't doubt that he's still going to be like 95% of what he has been doing in terms of being in those meetings. Obviously he's going to have veto power. I do think that there's a question. I mean, he's a really good play caller. So it's like, you know, if we're talking about like some collaboration presumably of justin fry and brian hartline you know is that better than ryan day calling plays i don't know um i think they also need to figure out somebody's gonna have to go upstairs like at least like you can't just have keenan bailey up there i think at least one of hartline and fry i think it has to be hartline i don't like the offensive line coach not being on the field has to be upstairs so i do think they have a bunch of these things to work out um but, you know, if he does, I think that he will still have a, a heavy hand in the game planning and, and probably, you know, v- veto authority, for lack of a better word, over the plays. So this year's team on defense gave up the highest uh, yards per play average in program history uh, against Michigan and then did worse than that against Georgia in the yards per play mod, in the yards per play measure. So the two worst yards per play in apparently program history that were the last two games. And, you know, you can log on to Twitter and see anyone getting their job called for, you know, at any given time for any reason whatsoever. But I saw a bunch of people who I don't necessarily consider nuts normally calling for Jim Knowles's head. And I mean, to me, that seems real, 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 real early. Like, you've got to, I mean, minimally give him one more year. When you look at the trend line at Oklahoma State, for example, where they went from 80th or something to, like, 60th to 30th to 5th in his four years there. Those aren't the exact numbers, but it's close enough. Um, Do do you not have to give Jim Knowles another year? Are you not expecting significantly better things from Jim Knowles next year? I mean, they were significantly better this year. 
already compared to last year. I mean, I think you have to start with how far they've fallen, both scheme wise, execution wise. You know, is <laughs> is Kirby Smart firing Will Muschamp tomorrow because they gave up one? They gave up forty one points to an Ohio State team that was down. As we said, their top two receivers, their top four tailbacks, their tight end. Um, if you go look at the history of, of the college football playoffs, scores in the high 30s and 40s are pretty much the norm. Uh, so I think people need to check a little bit their expectations of, of what's possible on defense. I mean, yeah, those t- I mean, Mich- Ohio State also in the last two games of the season played the, you know, the uh, two other playoff teams. So, you know, how many times you'd have to go back and look how many times in the last three games of the season did they do that? Um, you know, so I, I do think they've improved a lot. It's, it'd be crazy. You'd just be going back to square one. If you got rid of Jim Knowles, like it's not even worth the discussion because he's a good coach. He's, he has implemented a lot. I think there's a lot they need to do. I continue to think that he was running a fraction of some of the things you saw at Oklahoma state. And so I just have to chalk that up to, you know, there's only so much you can do in in year one and you know the personnel is what it is i mean they have they have some deficiencies in the back end um you know most of the year the focus was on the corners and it turned out that um you know for instance like ronnie hickman is a very good box safety um once teams figured out or had the ability i mean is some of it too to exploit him as a deep middle of the field safety or deep cover two safety you know they did so i mean you know, people after the, the Michigan game wanted them to be less aggressive, and they, they were, in fact, less aggressive against Georgia. Like, they came out running a bunch of t- Tampa 2, and Sets and Bennett picked it apart. And so, ironically, they, they were probably best against Georgia when they were playing man coverage, you know, and then Lance, Latham Ransom slipped. So, I, th- I think that people people need to pump the brakes. Um, there are things they need to improve. They're, they're, they need to be more diverse scheme-wise. Um, and they need to be better in the back end, but I think they'll be, I think they're on the right track. All right. So one thing that I def, I feel like we need to have you explain to everyone, let's all huddle up and let's, uh, let's see. I saw lots of people comparing the, uh, play with Tommy Eichenberger coverage on Arian Smith to the tough Borland Devonte Smith play. Uh, this was not a play where Tommy Eichenberg was in fact like, yeah, you just, just run man, man with him down the field. That was not actually the, what happened there. So can you explain what people, what people were actually looking at when they didn't necessarily realize what they were looking at there? Yeah. Again, I, as I just said, so Ohio state ran a bunch of Tampa two, particularly early in the game, but they mixed it in. So Tampa two, there's one of two ways they run it. Um, but the way they had, if your standard, you have the mic as what's called the pull runner. So he's going to carry any routes during the, d- down the middle. And the reason that Tampa two is created, because if you think about it in cover two, you have two safeties on each hash. And so you're vulnerable down the middle between them. So you're mitigating that. But the point of what Eichenberg was doing is he's carry. It's called carrying. So you see Georgia do that a bunch too. You carry the route vertically so that you're not just playing spot drop. We've talked about the problems with spot drop zone. But he's supposed to be carrying it to the back half safety. And again, as I just mentioned, like Ronnie Hickman got himself stuck in no man's land. He never gets enough depth. He sort of gets too caught up watching the play instead of doing what he's supposed to do as a zone defender. Uh, and so he had no one to carry it to. I mean, it was frankly an incredible play by Eichenberg to stay with him and to get him to the ground. I mean, you're playing underneath. You're playing a trail coverage technique because you're expecting the safety help. So, again, like, <laughs> you got to watch the game. <laughs> Helps certainly helps afterwards to be able to watch the all twenty two, uh, but like you gotta understand coverages. But you know, I I think sometimes like you have to have linebackers carry receivers. Like Ohio State beat beat Georgia, having them have to carry Xavier Johnson down the field. So you know, playing defense is hard. You're going to give up plays, uh, but it, it does help to have the framework in mind of what they're trying to accomplish. All right, and last one for you. I feel like we need to end on kind of a little bit of a big picture thing because we get a little nitty gritty on this stuff sometimes. And it feels like this was a game where, you know, I think everyone entered this game thinking, boy, if they get blown out again, I'm going to have real concerns about the Ryan Day era moving forward. And they very much did not get blown out in this game. They didn't win it, but they darn near won it. And they very easily could have won it. And you can have a thousand little what ifs, just like you had in the 2019 Fiesta Bowl. So, Ross, do you come away from this game 
more convinced or less convinced that they can and or will win a national championship in the next five years? More convinced. And I mean, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. Like, again, if you get on Twitter, you like like people like Max Toscano or Cody Alexander, like objective observers who do not have a, you know, no pun intended, a dog in the fight in that game were, you know, like Ohio State is a great team. They're going to win. They're super talented. Like, you know, it's a football game. You get breaks. Like, you know, I no one's going to convince me otherwise that if Marvin Harrison either doesn't get knocked out or they maintain that targeting call, like if you get one of those three or four calls to go your way, or even even without Harrison and there was like four plays where it's like, oh, maybe if like Stroud had an extra second, he could have dumped it off to this guy. And that's like one more big play. You're winning that game. And so and <laughs> Georgia's been the best team. So like, I mean, objectively speaking, this has probably been like the best four year run for Ohio State. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry. So as you can tell with my voice, still getting over a, a cold. So the. I mean, yes, Ohio State hasn't won a national championship, but like every one of these games are right there with the, the best two or three teams. Um, and so they just need a little bit more on defense, a little bit better luck health wise, and they're they're gonna be right there. Yeah, it does it does feel like a lot of people probably walked away from that game feeling a lot better about the Ryan Day era, win or lose, than they did going into that game. You know, there was, there was, I think, a lot of an expectation where they might get, they might get clobbered. It might be the typical non, non-competitive semifinal, and that definitely was not it. Yeah, and I know people want to focus on like offense a lot, but like the constant theme over, I mean, really since Urban Meyer was at became the coach is like Ohio State's defense has been pretty mediocre for the majority of that time at best, and so you know, I don't really have concerns about the Ohio State offense. I mean, I think Ryan Day has proven himself at this point like yes there's been games where they haven't scored over 30 but you know the they you i think that they i think they are going to take away the combination of the michigan game and the georgia game i think ryan day is going to take away the right lessons from that um and then you know as i said i think you do want the continuity on defense like you don't you don't want to go back to the drawing board again yeah, you have you have seen that sometimes defensive coordinator changes are great, and sometimes defensive coordinator changes are very much not great. And uh, Ryan Day has had uh, some positive and some negative in that area. And uh, Jim Knowles is, you know, certainly at least on the uh, too early to tell, but uh, trending in the right direction. I would say uh, on that one. So, uh, but uh, yes, that will be uh, just one of the many things we'll have to talk about during this off season. And boy, I just was, as I was starting to put this show together, I was like, Oh, I'll have to ask Ross about that. I'll have to ask Ross about that. I was like, all right, well, we're not going to do 72 minutes. So I guess we're gonna have to have Ross on again to talk about some other stuff in the coming weeks. And there's a lot to talk about as we, uh, as Ohio state starts to uh, rebuild, rebuild uh, its uh, roster, you know, potentially some shuffling on the coaching staff as well that, to come in the coming weeks. So a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff to talk about, a lot of stuff to watch and uh, a great place to do all of that is at BuckeyeHuddle.com. Ross has been very active on our message board the last uh, few days, answering questions about the game and telling people, you know, here's here's what you know, here's what that was, and and when you're looking at this, here's here's what you're actually seeing. Uh, really, really good place to get smarter about football. Talking to Ross and Devin and David and uh, Justin, all of our X's and News gurus, they are all at BuckeyeHuddle.com on the Huddle board. Sign up today to become a member, become a smarter football fan as well. Uh, that, and you can uh, also find all of our great stuff on YouTube at youtube.com slash Buckeye Huddle. We do some shows there. Plenty more on the Huddle board on the uh, at BuckeyeHuddle.com. So you can get even more at this, on the site. But uh, also check us out at youtube.com slash Buckeye Huddle. That will do it for today. Thank you guys all for joining us. Have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow.